Hi, uh, everyone. I'm a Hong Kong study scholar, but recently uh, I start to uh, doing more research about Asian geopolitics. I'm very happy to have the chance to speak with all of you today, uh, particularly with uh, Professor Nathan and Jai Min from Taiwan. We are all very good friends and work on this book project. I think uh, of the book could be traced back actually uh, to late 2015. Uh, at that time, uh, Jai Min and I met in Hong Kong uh, for an academic conference. I remember that at that meeting, I uh, we discussed the feasibility of doing uh, a comparative research uh, about Hong Kong, China influence in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Uh, because at that time, I, I told Jamin that I'm doing uh, China influence in Hong Kong and he's doing China influence in Taiwan. So I, okay. I think why not we together do a book project mm -hmm. uh, trying to compare China influence in Hong Kong and Taiwan. That would be very interesting. So that is the beginning of the of that book. Uh, after that meeting, we immediately start to line up uh, friends from Hong Kong and Taiwan uh, to uh, conduct different kinds of case study. So about 2017, I think, uh, I, I noticed that uh, China influence as a phenomenon is not just happened in Hong Kong and Taiwan, uh, but also increasingly become obvious in different places around the world. Uh, particularly uh, within Indo-Pacific regions in countries such as Australia and, and New Zealand. So at that time, I talked to Jamin again, why don't we expand the scope of the book to cover more cases from uh, more Asian countries? So I immediately mm. start to invite the second for second round <laughs> other mm -hmm. contributors from Southeast Asia, South Asia, Central Asia, and also Australia and New Zealand in order to uh, expand the scope mm. of the book. Uh, because of that, uh, it takes more time for us to compile the whole uh, book project from 2016 to 2020. We basically spent about five years in order to complete this book project. So that is the, the overall story of the book. And for me, uh, the basic objective of this book is very clear, is to provide a comparative analysis about China influence and its pushback uh, across different places in Indo-Pacific regions. For me, the major challenge of this book is how to come up with a framework that can, uh, that can be applied to uh, uh, different places uh, which are strikingly different uh, within the Indo-Pacific region. So that is the, the, finally the, the, uh, uh, the so-called concentric center periphery model that I come up with in the introductions of the book. Uh, I try to uh, uh, categorize different polities in Indo-Pacific regions into three major types First is the uh, peripheral autonomy, that is Hong Kong and Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong and Macau, uh, which are territorial autonomy under Chinese sovereignty. The second tier is Taiwan, which is facing the pleasure of China in corporations, and all others, the third tier is our other uh, Indo-Pacific countries. So that is the uh, major contribution we hope to make, uh, trying to put different cases in Indo-Pacific uh, countries together. Uh, within the framework so that uh, we can uh, uh, foster the dialogues uh, between uh, uh, different places uh, in order to generate more um, uh, geopolitical insight about the current situation that we are facing. Yeah. I am uh, Jianming Wu, Wu Jianmin from Taiwan, Academia Sinica Institute of Sociology. I've been working on this issue on Chinese influence operations for about a decade. And as Brian said, we cooperated on this project for almost five, six years. So it's it's just like a long shot, you know. We finally, finally we, we get to the uh, end point. All right, I, I want to say something about this book uh, plan. Uh, this book covers several key ideas. First, we think that the cases of Hong Kong and Taiwan under the, the, sh uh, the shadow of China can provide lessons to the rest of the world in understanding Chinese foreign behavior. For us to make sense of Beijing's sharp power operations, we should examine case by case and uh, issue area by issue area in order to build up a roadmap for a general picture. Therefore, uh, in this edited volume, we invite the scholars from Taiwan and Hong Kong to write on five issue areas in both places. These issues include election, tourism, news media, uh, entertainment and films, and religion. That's the first point. 
The second idea is that we think we need a historical perspective to fully understand Chinese external behavior accurately. So we invited experts on world systems, on imperialism, and the comparative colonialism to contribute. This is sort of to give Brian Fong's introduction chapter on the concentric framework a deeper historical breadth. The third one is that we found our analysis on uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong can be applied to, uh, to other regions. So we enlisted scholars on the Indo-Pacific regions, particularly from uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Central Asia, and Australia and New Zealand to consolidate our argument. Finally, we found that from the cases in Hong Kong and Taiwan that the targeted parties are not the units that can only passively receive influence operations. Instead, they can resist, they can push back. So over the last decade, we have been uh, seeing that uh, many counter mobilizations against the PRC in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, and elsewhere. Bearing this in mind, we have built the pushback dimension in our analysis. In most of our case studies, in our, you know, our case chapters, and Professor Andrew Nason, you know, especially wrote a chapter to summarize the counter movement and this and try to distill tentative conclusions from the case studies. Uh, this is the overall blueprint of our book. So I'm Andy Nathan. I'm a pro political science professor at Columbia and a member of the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. Um, I got involved in this project after it was well along, and the two co-editors asked me to join as a co-editor, and I'm proud that I did so. I contributed a chapter, but as I look at the whole book, I think it's it's quite an excellent Book. Unfortunately, it costs $160 in the hard copy. <laughs> but uh, so and but you can get an electronic copy, I think, for, for less. But it's really valuable. Brian and Jim have assembled a group of incredibly qualified contributors, some of them very well known in Western academic circles, some of them not so well known outside, but well known in Hong Kong and Taiwan who have done very deep research. So as uh, as they have described, the book is really tightly integrated around the concept of how China exerts its influence, especially in Hong Kong and Taiwan, uh, and, and how Hong Kong and Taiwan are kind of models of how China exerts its influence elsewhere in the world. And the chapter authors have done very deep research into these five areas that Jim and mentioned in terms of tourism, media, religion, elections, and what was the fifth one now I'm forgetting. But so that each entertainment and film. Yeah, so yes, the entertainment industry. So each each chapter covers uh the Taiwan and Hong Kong chapters are divided up by these five areas and then looks at the pushback at the end of each of those chapters. And then the other chapters on Central Asia, South Asia, New Zealand, Australia, and my chapter um, are uh, well, mine a little bit less so, but the other ones are again looking at these forms of influence. And then my chapter is looking at pushback. So there's a great deal of original research and deep insight into this. And I think the Hong Kong and Taiwan cases are really, really important because out of China, as China rises, it's trying to exert its influence everywhere, but especially in these two places, because Beijing considers these two places to be absolutely crucial for China's national mm -hmm. security. So China has invested a huge amount in trying to influence these areas. And whether that's going to succeed or not, we don't know. But they they especially use money because China has a lot of money to find uh, people in Hong Kong and Taiwan who have an important stake in cooperating, or as the chapter authors say, collaborating with 
China and its influence efforts, and China uses money elsewhere in the world as well. So you have this theme of, of Chinese pressure with money, and then you have the theme of pushback as, as there are forces in every society that don't want to be pushed around or bought by China, but the outcome is very, very, you know, uncertain. And I think it's important for everybody, but now especially for the United States, policymakers, public, academia, to, to really deeply understand how China is working to pursue its interests around the world. So I feel like this book um, is, is very important for that, for that important theme. And how it's all going to come out, it will be many, many years until we see. So in Hong Kong, we've seen the pushback has reached reached a crisis level last mm -hmm. year, and China then responded with a draconian crackdown that mm -hmm. looks now as if it's going to be able to control things in Hong Kong and in Taiwan, it, which is of course separated from China, but and and has its by a hundred miles and has its own autonomous political system, uh, it looks like the pushback, the desire not to be controlled by Beijing is at the present time a more, a stronger political force, but these battles are ongoing and we don't know how it's going to turn out in any of the countries uh, that uh, the book looks at. All right, thank you. Um, so I wanted to start by asking about um, it's been five years in the making for this book. A lot has happened in those five years in the region. Um, yeah. I can imagine that some of the the ideas or the things that you were writing uh, had to change a little bit while you were writing because of the developments in the region. Um, can you speak a little bit about that, about how um, current events affected your writing process? And did anything force you to revise or change your, your way of thinking? Uh, I think you're absolutely correct uh, that things have been rapidly changing, particularly in Hong Kong and Taiwan uh, over the past few years. But for me, the, the, the challenge is not to revise or shift our theoretical framework, because I think uh, uh, our framework uh, basically is very applicable to the situation despite of the fact that things have been fast changing, uh, uh, particularly over the past two years. Uh, it's only proved that uh, our framework in understanding China influence and its pushback is so wide uh, in the sense that we mm. every day, actually, when we finalize the book, every day there will be new cases, new example, new ex incidents that we should cover. So therefore, the, the major challenge for me is we need we at some point of time we really need to set a cut off day, <laughs> otherwise the books will never be finalized. <laughs> we know that Hong Kong and Taiwan has borne the brunt of China impact long before the Western countries realized the power and consequences of Chinese influence operations. So as to your question of any events that force us to re revise the original plans, uh, I would say yes. Uh, we in one respect, we rearranged the structure of the book and expanded, most importantly, expanded the scope of case countries. You know, in our original conception, back in around 2015, that Brian has said a lot about that, Brian and me uh, just thought about a comparison of Hong Kong and Taiwan alone under the Chinese influence. At that time, we have accumulated a few case studies about China are uh, China's sharp power operations in both places. Although the notion of sharp power hadn't uh, proposed yet, all right? But so many events coming up globally regarding China's aggressive outward policies that made us to expand our project. So uh, in the following, I will just give you a few you know, instances to, to explain this uh, dynamic process. First, the third missile dispute between South Korea and China in 2016 is pivotal. South Korea is very highly dependent on Chinese domestic market, including autos, electronics, tourism, and uh, popular cultural products. So when South Korea proceeded with the deployment of third missile system, Beijing began to sanction Seoul economically. And this wave of sanction it's just uh, just like a break in, you know, in full fury. Okay, 
So Beijing cut on the supply of, of tourism, tourists to, to Korea uh, and banned the K-pop, you know, the popular culture of groups, K-pop groups performance in China and the targeted on the Lot Business Group, Le Tian Jitan Lot Group, who provided the land for the develop, deployment of the missiles. So why is South Korean case so alarming to us, especially to, to the Taiwanese? Because, you know, because um, the measures that Beijing utilized to punish South Korea has been widely applied in this sanction on Taiwan. They are so strikingly similar, similar, okay? So I realized immediately after that, that what the framework I propose to study Taiwan and Hong Kong also makes sense in the South Korean case, as I have explained in detail in my chapter. Then there is Australia. Over the past decade, Australia has become more and more dependent on Chinese market. In the meantime, there are more Chinese business immigra immigrants and students coming in. Beijing used the expanding Chinese communities to penetrate into Australia political arena. Around 2017, a scandal erupted. The Labour Party Senator Sam Dusty Airy accepted money from Chinese business person and supported some pro-China policy. This e event becomes a scandal together with other uh, operations exposed by the media and scholars in Australia, forced the Australian government to re revise laws in prevention from the Chinese influence. So the, chi so the, the Australian incident is, you know, is a wake up call for the, for the Western world. Moreover, there is the report about the Czech Republic. We know China has gained access into the uh, central, uh, Eastern Central Europe by way of the Belt and Road Initiative. Czech Republic at one time was deeply penetrated by a Chinese businessman called uh, Ye Jianmin. He allegedly had cross ties to Xi Jinping. And Czech, Czech Republic received money and favors from China, and it seems not to cause any serious concern in that country until, until missed yeah, was arrested in China by Xi Jinping on charges of corruption in 2018. So before Ye's arrest, there was even a report that Mr. Ye is seeking influence inside the Beltway. We have incorporated all the above um, events with related matters into our analysis in this volume. So that's what the readers, you know, will from it. It seems that, um, you know, all of these new examples helped expand the scope of your work, but uh, thankfully the framework really held in place. It showed that any uh, breaking events still um, meshed with the conceptual framework that you created. Um, so I, I guess I'm asking now, um, so how do you expect to apply this framework in the future? And can it be applied beyond the Chinese example? I think there are actually two directions uh, to expand this framework. First is, as you have mentioned, and also uh, mentioned by, explained by Jamie, uh, this framework has a, a great potential to be applied to uh, many other countries and regions outside uh, the Indo-Pacific. So um, I think one of the direction is actually uh, based on the framework, which uh, try to study China influence according to, for example, economic, uh, diplomatic, military, and legal influence, all these things. We can uh, think about doing a comparative data set, uh, trying to uh, quantitatively measure different kinds of influence operations uh, of China around the world. So that is one of the uh, directions. Of course, this direction is not easy to do because uh, there will be uh, a lot of technical difficulties uh, in if we try to uh, apply the framework uh, to different places. The second direction is I think we can actually apply this framework uh, on, on measuring the power projection activities of other major autocracy uh, apart from China. For example, we can also apply it on the power projection of uh, activities of Russia 
and also Iran, uh, how they uh, make use of economic influence operations or military operations to influence uh, the places uh, surrounding them uh, in order to establish their uh, sphere of influence. So these are the two directions that uh, we can think about uh, in the broader context of uh, somehow what we call the, the, the comparative authoritarianism. I think our framework makes a step further for the study of shock power, authoritarian diffusion, and the pushbacks by the targeted nations. Briefly, we have several innovations. First of all, we remodeled the traditional studies of communist regimes united from work or united from strategy, uh, so, so to speak. Secondly, we apply a new approach to analyze the sharp power operations. That is, we discover there's almost always a hidden political agenda under Chinese external business behavior. On the surface, the exchange between the Chinese companies and the foreign partners are purely commercial and therefore uh, turn to be beneficial, you know, mutually beneficial and innocuous. But when you probe deeper, you may dig out the political motivations of the Beijing regime. This is what we call the commercialization of the United Front strategy. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly in this book, we have brought to attention a mode of operation by the Chinese government, that is the penetration from within. Because any foreign political influence always needs some uh, internal cooperation, you know, cooperation from inside the society in order to achieve its political goal. So the Chinese have tried very hard to cultivate uh, local collaborators or local agents within the targeted country. We believe this framework will ha help shed some light on the study of Chinese influence operations in other regions, and it will help further compare the case of China to that of Russia. Last question, I think Andy might have something to say on this one, but uh, so uh, as everyone is aware, there has been a shift in administrations in the US. And I know we were talking about Russia, but US-China relations, um, you know, they have an, a, an enormous impact on the region overall. Um, I was wondering if you had any predictions for how this great power competition will evolve under President Biden uh, in the U.S. and what impact that will have over the overlapping peripheries, how that fits into the framework or can be applied. Under the Trump administration, all these things were going on that are described in the book. They were going on in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and in Sri Lanka, and in New Zealand, Australia, and in the United States and in Europe. All the things that Jim and has talked about were, were happening. Uh, but the Trump administration really didn't um, work with allies to try to resist. Resistance that occurred in different countries was country by country, really. What the Biden administration uh, ha has uh, announced and sort of started out to do is to work, re resume working with allies. And, uh, and that may strengthen the forces of resistance to Chinese influence to a certain extent. But as, as Brian and Jim have brought out in the chapters in the book, bring out that Chinese influence is in some ways different from Russian and Iranian and other influence because Chinese, China has a lot of money. <laughs> this is really the bottom line. Uh, and so many, many countries are, uh, dependent on China in trade terms, Australia being a great example of that. Uh, Australian exports go predominantly uh, to China. Many countries are dependent on China for infrastructure investment through the Belt and Road Initiative. Many uh, media enterprises in many, many countries have been purchased by or invested in by China, the American movie business to increasingly de and car business increasingly depend on the China market and so on. So the, this model of Chinese uh, recruitment of collaborators or cooperators through financial interest really 
is what jumps out at me from this book. And whether the Biden administration has enough money and is willing to put money and is politically able to put out money um, with allies, with Europe, with Japan, in such a way as to compete with Chinese financial influence and offer those who want their independence from China some kind of other option, that's very much an open question to me. Um, you know, the United S China has a lot of money and the United States has a huge budget deficit and as well as political resistance to big government. So I don't know whether we with our allies will be able to effectively check Chinese influence attempts. The Russians, um, you know, tend to want to undermine um, other systems. The Chinese are not interested in undermining. They they want to work their way in and find allies, and uh, and 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 move the domestic politics of different countries in a way that's more friendly to Chinese interests. So it's a, a bit of a different model. Um, of course, this raises the question of whether China's economy will continue to flourish, and that's really outside the bounds of this book and this discussion. But we never know what, or you know, how China itself will evolve. But it would not make sense to kind of count on China economy collapsing or China changing its uh, national interests. China has a national interest in influencing other countries around the world, and it's going to continue to try to do so. It's not, it's, you know, it's, it, it makes sense from the point of view of their national interest. So I think it's a, a, very much an open question how well the Biden administration will be able to come back in and pull together the forces that uh, that want to protect national independence, really, whether it's in, uh, you, you know, the Asian region or in Europe or the United States. It's an open question. I just have a quick point to, to make because Andy has, uh, has explained the, the future uh, uh, picture uh, quite well. And uh, as Andy says, uh, there are so many uncertainties involved in this uh, U.S.-China uh, competition. Um, and but uh, from from our regional perspective, because we are in the periphery, you know, we are we are in the in the overlapping periphery. So we are under the impact of China and also under the impact of US. So we we can't find a way out, you know, because in order to to uh, maintain our autonomy or independence. So uh, our analysis in this book, uh, I think, remains valuable in this post-Trump era, because the strategic competition between the US or China or the US-China rivalry, I think is, is very deep and structural. I'm not prone to thinking that the Biden administration will take a U-turn of Trump's China policy. But of course, this administration will adopt new discourse and the policies to tackle the difficulty, the difficult uh, China problem. Beijing will not, I think, uh, will not relinquish its efforts to control on either on Xinjiang, Tibet, or on Hong Kong. And it would also double down on its aggressive policies, no matter in military, diplomatic, or economic fronts toward Taiwan. So in my estimation, this problem, uh, this China problem, I, I, as I put it, will continue to be there for a very long period. In this regard, we should invest more talent and resources into this study of China, Chinese influence operations in the future. Uh, the only points I would like to make is that uh, I think that uh, in terms of uh, US-China great power competitions, I think there may be some magnitude changes, but not directional changes uh, in, in under the Biden administrations because Based on the remarks and posture made by the Biden administration in its inauguration, uh, it is quite clear that uh, U.S. will continue to see China as its uh, major competitor and will continue to directly uh, compete with China on different issues, including 
Taiwan and Hong Kong, and there is a very strong bipartisan support among Democrats and Republicans for this approach. Uh, on the other hand, I think the, the chance for China to abandon its geopolitical assertive approach is also very low. So therefore, uh, there are structural reasons that uh, the, the, the great power competitions between the two countries will go on. However, uh, the actual dynamics may be different when compared with the Donald Trump administration. Uh, as rightly pointed out by uh, uh, Professor Levin, uh, Biden administration is more eager to work with allies. Because of that, uh, that means uh, U.S. geopolitical response to China uh, will be much more prudent and less dramatic. 